rejoicing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of what you have made us, the gospel of your love, your mercy, and your patience, and your faithfulness. Father, hear our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're going to continue on in our Samuel series. We've been working our way through 1 Samuel. We now come to chapter 4. And I'd like to read that with you right now. So in 1 Samuel 2 and 3, we've been introduced to Samuel. We've, it's largely been about Samuel. And in chapter 3, the Lord begins to reveal Himself, bring His Word to Samuel so that Samuel can be this means of bringing the Word to Israel. And now we're going to read chapter 4. Samuel is largely absent from this chapter, but it is a very significant chapter in the history of God's people. So let's read 1 Samuel 4. We'll begin at verse 1. And the Word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli... Hophni and Phinehas were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid. For they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and they fled, every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, What is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old. And his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, How did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken and he died. For the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel forty years. 
Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women attending her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God has been captured, had been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters, beloved in Christ, the immense significance of the events in 1 Samuel 4 is hard to overstate. You look at what happens. Israel is defeated. The ark of the Lord is captured. The high priest, who was also the judge of Israel, the leader of Israel, and his two sons, who were serving as priests, are dead. And then there is a child born as an orphan. It is personally, nationally, religiously, or spiritually speaking, all of it a disaster. It's one of the saddest stories that you can read in Scripture. In the words of Phinehas' wife, the mother of Ichabod, express it all. The glory has departed. Israel is undone. And so this morning we're going to look at that. We're going to look at this account in the history of Israel and the history of God's people and see that the glory has departed from Israel. And as we look at that, we're going to see three things that are connected to this glory departing. The first is ignorant worship, and the second is, is just judgment, and finally we're going to look at this informed sorrow that is there. So ignorant worship, it, as the glory departs from Israel, we see ignorance. Now typically you have two types of ignorance. You can say, oh, he's ignorant. Now, that can mean he doesn't know everything that he needs to know about the topic. It's simply a description of their lack of knowledge. But you can also say he is ignorant, and you can say he's offensive. He's hurtful. He's just an ignorant guy. Now, in this passage, in this account, what we're going to see is that there is ignorant worship in both senses senses of the word. You know, as you look at the story, you see what happens. In verses 1 and 2, Israel is defeated by the Philistines at Ebenezer. Now, we're not sure if this is the same Ebenezer as 1 Samuel 7, verse 12. I think we'd like it to be a different place because Ebenezer does not look good in chapters 4 and 5. You'll see that Ebenezer is the site of two horrendous defeats of Israel and the capture of the ark of God. The glory departs at Ebenezer. And so they have this battle at Ebenezer and they, they're defeated. And, and what happens is the elders, they come together and they ask, why? And what's interesting is they recognize that Yahweh, the Lord, is the one who is responsible the Lord has defeated us. Why, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? So this is good. They recognize that they have, that the Lord is the one in control and something has gone wrong. It's reminiscent of Ai. If you can remember Joshua 7 and 8, after the fall of Jericho, they go to Ai, but there has been, Achan has sinned. 
And the Lord is upset with Israel and they're defeated by this little town and, and, the, and they come together and say, what has gone wrong? And they speak to the Lord. The Lord tells them what's happened and what they need to do. Now, children, you may be familiar with the story and perhaps you're thinking, okay, that's what they're going to do right now, right? They're going to go to Samuel because just before verse, you know, at the very beginning of this chapter, it says, you know, the Lord's word came to Samuel and then Samuel's word came to all Israel. So they would go to Samuel and say, what is the Lord's will? But that's not what happens, is it? They come up with this decision to take the ark into battle. And there's a number of problems with this response. The first is they ignore the word. They walk right past Samuel. They actually walk right past Eli as well, it appears. They go right past him and they go to the ark. You know, the word was rare, it says in 1 Samuel 3, but it wasn't absent. In 1 Samuel 3, we see the word returning to Israel through Samuel. They ignore it. They ignore the word. And then they ignorantly treat the ark in the sense of they don't have knowledge of what they're doing and they're also handling it offensively. They fail to understand the incredible thing that the ark is. And the writer of 1 Samuel doesn't let us miss it. Notice how he describes the ark. It says, they say, you know, let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord. That's verse 3. And then in verse 4, and they brought from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, Yahweh of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. This is their God. And his ark, this ark is this place where he has chosen to let his name dwell, his presence be on earth and in Israel. It's a place that's kept in the holy of holies. God's presence was focused there on earth. The, the Jewish publication, the JPS, it's the Jewish translation of what we call the Old Testament, the Torah, the law, prophets. It has this translated this way. Our translation says it, thus he, it will be with us, but it's literally, thus he will be present among us and will deliver us from the hand of our enemies. So they knew the presence of God was connected to the ark, but they just didn't understand how big God was. He, he was so small for them. And they thought they could do this. But at the end of the day, it was, it was offensive. In an, it was ignorant in this offensive way. What they did is they took the ark of God and they abused Yahweh, the Lord, and worship of Him. They were treating Him like an idol, like the nations treated their gods. They used it like a mascot. God was somebody they could just kind of slip into their pocket and take with them. I now have Yahweh with me. He's right here. He's my God. And I can take Him and I will now be able to have success because I've got him right here. It's self-willed worship. It's worship where they are in control of God. That's really what pagan worship was and the Lord speaks about that throughout, throughout the Pentateuch, through the five chooks of Moses. You don't do that with me. Don't think you can manipulate me, manipulate my word, manipulate my actions. I am Yahweh. But Israel's become like other nations. And it's a failure that happens at a national level all the way down to the people. You know, it comes from the leaders, the, the soldiers, the people come back from the battlefield and, 
And the leaders go, what's going on? And the leaders say, let's do this. They, they take the ark with Hophni and Phinehas, the spiritual leaders of the, church, of, of, the, of the people, and they bring it onto the battlefield, and all the people cheer. They're all excited. It's a failure of the covenant people, all Israel. And it's interesting to see the reaction of the Philistines, in which really highlights how Israel has become like the other nations, how they have just descended into ignorant worship, unknowing worship, offensive worship. The Philistines completely agree with Israel. They're like, whoa, they took the ark. That's brilliant. We're in trouble. I mean, that's a powerful God to have in your pocket. I mean, they don't know everything about what Yahweh did. They think that it happened in the wilderness. But they know something about the God of Israel, or the gods as they call it. They know that they were, you know, 400 years ago, they 500 years ago, they knew what happened. And they're afraid. And what we see is that the ignorance that Israel displays here, what happens in 1 Samuel 4 is an ignorance that simply repeats itself throughout the history of God's people. It's something that happens in our own lives as well. When you look back to the fall, the beginning of humanity's history, Adam and Eve essentially act ignorantly in both senses of the word. They think they can know more. They, they think they know. They, they don't understand the full scope of who is talking to them in the serpent. They don't understand what God has in store for them. And then they act offensively in taking that fruit from the tree because they want to be like God. They believe God has held something back from them. They had this incredible glory, God with them, living in the garden, God, God walking with them in the, in the garden, perfect fellowship. They had that glory, kings and queens of creation, and in their ignorant worship, their ignorance in terms of what they knew about God and, and how they treated Him, they lost that glory, and the glory departed from them. You know, it's important for us to understand that in 1 Samuel 5, the glory had really already departed from Israel. And that glory departing from Israel is evidenced in their ignorant worship. They had left first. You know, they had abused and ignored God. They had spurned His glory. They had lived like the other nations. The glory is going to depart in the sense that the ark leaves, but Israel had already left God. The glory departs in ignorant worship. And so the question that comes to us as we consider this ignorant worship, is this just a story of ancient times, of simplistic ideas about faith and life, how worship happens? Let me put this question to you. Is it possible that Israel's elders were a step ahead of us in their worship of God? Do you notice they knew that the Lord was responsible for what was happening to them? But do we actually even start there when things are happening in life, when things are going on in your, your, your family, when they're going on in your church, when they're going on in your community, your nation, your whatever it is that you're involved with, and you're trying to figure out a way forward, do you actually begin with, why has Yahweh, why has God done this to me? God is in control of all things. Where is God in this and do I come to Him? Now they messed up in not coming to Him, but do we even think to go to Him? Is God the God of all of our life? 
It's one of the ironies of the Christian faith and what it's done is it's spread all over the world. Christianity has replaced paganism in many places. And what happened is, is Jesus has replaced the high gods, but the gods of the, the spirit world, the, the gods that kind of control, you know, your work, your driving to work, your traveling on the road, all these little gods, these, all these little minor deities, those ones are washed out of the way. And so God is only a God of the big things and not of everything in life. Christianity has become a paganizing force in the world because it removes the involvement of God in all of life. So in a sense, Israel was ahead of us in our Western world. It recognized that God was involved. Now it treated them, treated Him ignorantly. It did horrible things. But let us not feel elitist or somehow more advanced than they the fact of the matter is that the glory departs from us in the same way it departs from them we feel God is distant from us but we have become distant from him first something we need to recognize as church is we're the people of God the spirit filled church We've been given the Word of God to guide us. That God has come near to us in Jesus Christ, His Son. Come near to us by His Spirit. Come near to us in speaking through His Word. That's the wonder of God with us. That's the means of grace. Israel in 1 Samuel 4 just botched it horribly by not making use of the means of grace, by misusing the means of grace. So the call comes to you as you read this passage, as you see this this ignorant worship, make use of the means of grace. Don't walk by the word like the elders walk by Samuel. Go to him and know him and worship him rightly. Don't be ignorant of who he is. You know, our glory, our worth is wrapped up in, in the Lord, in Jesus Christ. And so, worship of Him involves knowing His glory, His majesty, and knowing that you can't handle Him like He's an it, like, it's, like He's something that you can, you can say, I've got Him on my side, I'm going to put Him in my pocket For those of you familiar with the Chronicles of Narnia, you can remember the line about Aslan. He's not a tame lion. Don't think that God has been domesticated for you. Know His glory and His majesty. And then follow Him. Don't make him someone that is used to accomplish your goals. Don't think that we are aligned with him because of what others think. Don't think that he is on our side simply because of who we are in and of ourselves. It's something to think about. As you read through commentaries, this this text is addressed by theologians from various ecclesiastical backgrounds. And almost all of them ask the question about churches that they knew, churches they grew up in. Is the glory gone? There's churches that exist still, but their worship is ignorant. It's ignorant in the sense that they don't know the Word, they don't study the Word. It's ignorant in the sense that they mishandle the Word and use the Word, use God. They've abandoned Him. They have beautiful church buildings, but not many people. That's a warning to all of us. 
We don't just get to look at other churches and go, see, look what happened there. The danger for us is that we become complacent, we become ignorant in understanding who God is, what He has done in Jesus Christ, ignorant of the gospel. And then we begin to handle God as somebody who serves us. And then it may happen, as one commentator put it, that we wake up one day and we realize the glory has departed. We're just a bunch of people who thought they had God. That's what happened to Israel. And they found out that they didn't have Him like they thought they did. And so we're going to look at that just judgment. And so Israel goes into the next battle with the ark. And they suffer another staggering defeat. And it's at the same place. When you look at 5 verse 1, the Philistines, they take the ark from Ebenezer. The camp's there at Ebenezer and the ark goes there. The cheer happens there. There's all this excitement. The Philistines are all worried about it. They fight extra hard. And Israel is defeated even worse than it was before. 30,000 dead. Hophni and Phinehas dead. The ark of the Lord of hosts captured. Taken by the enemy. It's important to see this is not about Yahweh being defeated. It's about Yahweh's judgment. We see that as you look at how the, the writer, likely Samuel, writes this, this part. What happens is he lists everything that happens, and Hophni and Phinehas dying is the climax. You have that verses 10. The Philistines fought. Israel's defeated. They fled. There was a great slaughter. 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel died. The ark of God was captured. And then finally, mic drop. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. What God said in 1 Samuel 2, what He said in 1 Samuel 3, has now happened. Samuel is confirmed as prophet. This is in fulfillment of the word that came through Samuel, the word they ignored. So when you think about this just judgment that happens in the glory departing from Israel, what you have is God defeating His enemies in Israel. This is about God departing from His people because they ignored and abused what He had given them. And what He's doing is He's taking the old order, Eli's line. And as He promised in, in 1 Samuel 2, as He says in 1 Samuel 3, your house will be devastated. And God's going to make a new start. He's bringing to an end the, the corrupt priestly line. He's ending Eli's judgeship. And something to think about with the, the leadership of Israel. They had fattened themselves off of Israel, off of Yahweh. You notice that Eli is described as being a very fat man. You notice he's always sitting, by the way. He's never actually doing much. But he clearly was complicit in all the food that his sons were taking. He was enriching himself off of Yahweh as well. The corrupt worship was going to come to an end. And God was going to make that happen. As Hannah, in her, her prayer at the end of 1 Samuel 1 and beginning of 1 Samuel 2, it, there is this reversal happening in Israel. And God's doing it now. The ears of people are going to tingle ring from what He's doing. But what must strike us here is something that was unexpected. What was unexpected is that God brings about this judge judgment and it touches Him. Do you see that? It's not just that Israel is justly judged 
in the death of Hophni and Phinehas, the defeat, the ark of Yahweh is taken. The Lord's footstool is taken. Yahweh Himself is taken. We receive here a glimpse of hint of how God will work His salvation in Jesus Christ. God's presence doesn't leave the ark. This is not the end of the ark, not the end of Yahweh. No, he enters the enemy camp. He goes outside the gates of Israel and is taken by the Philistines. Now, as we'll see in the following chapters, the Philistines will not enjoy his company. Children, you might remember the story. It's a pretty... When you really dig deeply into what happens to the Philistines, it's almost laughable what happens to them, to their gods. They will not enjoy his company. But the reality of the matter is that the ark is taken captive. The glory of God on earth, His presence on earth is carried off. And this is something that points us to Jesus Christ. You know, God's just judgment will be carried against humanity, against our sins, against us. The just judgment for what humanity did in rejecting, rebelling against God, offending God, that will happen. But for His people, God's own Son will pay the price. God the Father will give His Son, Jesus Christ, who is taken by the enemy, taken outside the gates, taken to Golgotha, paraded and displayed like a trophy of the powers of evil, and then He's put to death. Jesus is God with us. He is the glory of God. Exact, rec- exact representation of His being. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. And He stands in our place for sin. And God's just judgment is executed on humanity, but it's focused on Him. God Himself is touched. Jesus dies. But death cannot hold Him. The grave will receive, like the Philistines received the ark, they will receive a guest they did not want, and He will be victorious. The enemy's victory will mean their defeat. And even here, already in 1 Samuel 4, not all is lost. God is still at work. He is is going to make His name great by what happens while the ark is in Philistia. We may have abandoned Him. Israel may have abandoned Him. But that doesn't mean that He abandons us as we deserve. Even in the just judgment. He takes the burden on Himself. He pays the price and He brings us back. That's the gospel. And that's what's going on here in 1 Samuel 4. And then finally we see just this informed sorrow that happens as the glory departs Israel. Because the significance of the ark being taken is not lost on the people. The people know what has happened. God has left them. Yahweh has left them. It's an identity crisis. The exile, which will happen approximately 500 years after this, will be a similar experience for the people of God. Their world is turned upside down. God is not with us. We took Him for granted. We thought He was ours. Ours to handle. Ours to to use. We abused Him. And He left. And it's evidenced by the sorrow. We see that they know it by the sorrow they express. And the sorrow is is largely centered on the capture of the ark. You you have the man from from Benjamin coming from the battle line. He's bringing the news. He brings it to the city. The city's in uproar. He brings it to Eli. Phinehas' wife hears about it. But it's the death 
of God, so to speak. Not the death of the 30,000, not the death of Hophni and Phinehas. It's the exile of God that cuts the deepest. You know, you see that in Eli. You know, in this account, he shows complicity. He was just sitting there. They had to walk past Samuel, but they had to walk past him to get the ark. Yeah, he's worried about it, but he's the high priest. He trembles for it. He knows it was wrong. He's, he knows it's unwise. He fears for the ark. And when he hears the news about his son, sons, he doesn't fall over and die. No, when he hears about the ark, it's a shock that he was not expecting. This is now what Yahweh has done. And he dies. And then we especially see it, and it's an interesting detail for the writer of 1 Samuel to include. you ever think about that? The woman is not named. She's simply identified as the wife of Phinehas. But she provides the commentary. She hears about her father-in-law. She hears about her husband. But it's the ark being captured that is emphatically for her the most important and dominant detail of the story. And it's said twice. She hears about, verse 19, she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and her father-in-law and her husband were dead. So you have the ark there. Then she says in verse 21, she named the child Ichabod, saying the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And then again, third time, and she said the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. And she dies in childbirth. And she gives this name to her son Ichabod. Literally, it can be translated as the glory has departed, or where is glory? The glory has been, it literally says, exiled from Israel. But it's an informed sorrow. The glory departs, but it's an informed sorrow. God is still working on His people He is not completely absent. They lose him that they might find him again. Sometimes the sting of God's judgment for our sin must be felt. When you're stuck in sin and there's pain, there's sorrow, there's there's suffering either because of consequences of what you've done or guilt for what you've done, don't try to obscure it. Don't say, I don't want to have the sorrow. I just want to know it's okay. Sometimes you need to let the sorrow sit. You need to let it chastise you. You know, the canons of Dort, one of our confessions as church, chapter 5, article 5, says this. It's in the context of saints, those who are elect, those who belong to God, falling into serious sins. And it says, they greatly offend God, incur the guilt of death, grieve the Holy Spirit, severely wound their consciences, and sometimes for a while sense, lose the sense of God's favor until they return to the right way with sincere Repentance and God's fatherly face shines upon them again. Sometimes we sin, but God in the just judgment, God in His actions in our hearts spurs repentance and return. That knowing that things are not right is a sign of God's grace. A sign of complete abandonment by God would be that you would not care. It's a great line. I've used it before. It's a line from David Powelson. Give thanks to God that you struggle with sin. 
because you struggle with it. You don't want it to be there. That's the wonder of the gospel. God works in us by His Spirit and awareness of our sin and misery. He drives us to the cross, to Jesus Christ. We have this knowledge that things are not right, that there's a problem in our relationship with God, that something needs to be addressed, and we grieve. We know we need a Savior. We know that we can't do it. You know, at the end of 1 Samuel 4, Israel is sitting there in mourning, wondering, what have we done? What can be done? Just like the people beat their chest after Jesus died. Something was wrong. They were still ignorant. They still didn't know. They were still living with God's just judgment. But something was happening in their informed sorrow. Something is wrong and we long for it to be right. And that longing is there at the end of 1 Samuel 4. That child is born, Ichabod. Where is the glory? And in that child's name, there's a crying out for another child, Jesus Christ. A child who will mean that the glory is here. His name will be, here is glory. That Jesus Christ will be born, the Son of God incarnate. He will become a man who will die on a cross and cry out as he is actually and completely abandoned by God. He will cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Israel is not completely abandoned by God in 1 Samuel 4. There's more to come in the story. And God has not completely forsaken you either, wherever you are in your story. You may feel completely abandoned, distant from Him, but the call comes out to you. Don't ignore the Word. Make use of the means of grace. Come to know the God that you belong to, the God who is so powerful, but the God of grace. Long for His grace. You know what justice is in the face of the God who is there. But think of His grace and rest in His grace. Long for Him to work in you. In Jesus Christ, God abandoned us, gave us the just judgment that we should have deserved so that we might never be forsaken by Him. Never abandoned. He did it to His Son so He wouldn't do it to us. 1 Samuel 4 points us to that gospel. He is with us always. Amen. Let's now sing in response to the proclamation of the gospel. We'll sing hymn 53, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.